All right, well, good morning. Last Sunday in April, this month is flying by, years flying by. It was a pretty good week at work, and I've been in a new position for two months this week. And we made some, we made progress towards our goals. But as I started thinking about what we want to accomplish and what's still on our to-do list, I got to tell you, it got a little discouraged. And part of it just comes from my expectations, my impatience. I have been told by some people that I can be a bit impatient and that the expectations, I just want to have like a couple of most improved trophies in the lobby and four or five published articles and I feel like two months is plenty of time to have that and to be branched out into every position in the hospital. But evidently, there's a little bit more work to do. So uh, I was thinking about that discouragement Saturday. And I've got great support at work, at home. But I think we all get discouraged from time to time. We all just beat our heads against the wall, or it seems like things just will never get better. And discouragement seldom travels alone. How many times does it travel with doubt and anxiety and even fear? Fear that it won't ever get better. All these feelings can poke at us and wear us down. Sometimes discouragement can pass on its own. I have my little bout of pity and I'm feeling better and I'm looking forward to this next week. But sometimes it's like a kudzu vine. You know a kudzu vine, it gets into a field and before you know it, it's all over everything. It grows inches a night. Wrapped around every part of your life, choking out any spiritual fruit that you're meant to produce. Is anybody feeling down in the mouth this morning? It's okay if you say you are. Today we're going to talk about one of the most amazing people to ever be written about in God's Word. And if you have your Bibles, I'm going to get you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 19, starting with verse 1. Now, these first four verses, what had happened, we're talking about Elijah the prophet in the previous chapter. And to give you a little bit of the history about Elijah, he was one of the greatest prophets to ever serve God. <laughs> Just a what an amazing life. He was one of only two people mentioned in the Bible who went to heaven without dying first. The first was Enoch in the uh, book of Genesis. He was around in Noah's later life. So around chapters... Seven, eight, somewhere around in there. He was chosen by God. Elijah would even make a later appearance. He's one of the few people written about in the Old and New Testament. John the Baptist preached in the spirit of Elijah. Many similarities to him. The voice crying out in the wilderness. And Jesus himself confirmed that John fulfilled the prophecies the Jews had that Elijah would come to prepare the way for the Messiah. Also, something written about in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Transfiguration on the mount of where Elijah joined Jesus and Moses. Out of everyone mentioned in the Bible, King David, Solomon, Samuel, Elijah was chosen. That shows how much stock God had in this man. He was a man of faith and known for his faith and his prayers and his dedication to serving God. In chapter 18, Elijah had a showdown with the 450 priests of Baal on Mount Carmel. There's some churches named Mount Carmel. This is where that comes from. Baal was a God worshipped in a lot of the Near East. Part fish, Part man. One thing about them, very bloodthirsty religion. Children and child sacrifices were common with this. And the king of, at the time, Ahab and his wife Jezebel, and that's where it comes from, Jezebel. They had the rest of Israel they turned away from God and they were worshiping this, this idol. Elijah won the showdown. They had two altars 
And the winner was basically whoever was a real god would have the altar, their sacrifice burned. Fire would come up. The priests of Baal were out there cutting themselves and praying and all this. And Elijah had his altar dumped with water and water. And in a single moment, fire came down from the sky. It was lit up. And Elijah put them all to the sword. And you'd think the hero would ride off into the sunset, everything would be good. Nope. Jezebel began to chapter 19, told him she was going to kill him in 24 hours. I think the first lesson we learned from Elijah is that the strongest and most faithful people can get depressed and discouraged. And it can come from several different reasons. I think probably some part of Elijah thought this would be done. He had accomplished these goals. And he hadn't. There was still more fights to have. And how many times have you had a great personal victory in your life, but it was followed by times of doubt and discouragement and depression? I think most of us who were honest have that. And when those things come in, they can be called, a number of things can aggravate them. Emotional stress, physical fatigue, our own personalities. I know like with myself, I can be my worst critic. Body chemistry. Body chemistry is definitely a part of our physical and mental health. Genetic makeup, other factors. They can combine to bring on depression and discouragement. Most of all, notice these feelings aren't really related to our spiritual commitment. It's simply a result of being human. Oh, no, y'all come up there here. Y'all come out in the rain. I'm going to interrupt your sermon. No, I haven't. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> come on, third round submission. Y'all, it's raining here in South Carolina. We're not going to have uh, folks going out in the rain. I've had times in my life where I've heard people say when people are suffering, well, they should have more faith. That irritates me to no end. It is not that someone can just fake their way out of a depression or a discouragement. God can help us through those things, but we may still end up suffering. It doesn't mean you're a bad person or that you're lacking. People committed to God are not immune to being human. We doubt. We struggle. Positive or negative, emotions are part of that humanity. And our emotions, our emotions and our physical well-being, our physical body, they have a connection. I mean, how many people are rosy with about four or five hours of sleep a night for a couple of nights? No. How many people, if they're used to eating breakfast, are in a great mood by the time at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock goes around? No. And not even going to talk about coffee. I three cups a day. As sure as I'm standing here. And I think that's why using our emotions as a yardstick for our spiritual condition, <laughs> that, can be, that can be kind of dangerous because there may be other things going on with that. Feeling good and happy, though, is not always a measure <laughs> of commitment to God. You can be happy and be a heathen up one side and down the other. Likewise, though, feeling depressed and discouraged and anxious, doubtful, Feeling like you've had enough, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad person. Or that you have had a spiritual relapse, or that you've just gone away from God. It means you're struggling. Just like this man is struggling right here. This is a man that could perform miracle after miracle. This is a man that spoke to kings. This is a man that literally called down fire from God. And he's feeling abandoned right now. He's depressed.
in verse 4, after he fled, fled, God answering his prayer one day in 24 hours, he fled. He even left his servants sitting there out into the wilderness. Got up under the only tree he could find to escape this, the heat. And he said, I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. That's in 24 hours. A man who is mentioned in both Testaments, a man who makes an appearance with Jesus, and he's discouraged and he's worn out. I think that a lot of us have been guilty of what Elijah's doing. Even though God's taken away our sin, he's given us new life, he continues to pour out his blessings on us. When something goes wrong, that one thing is what we see. I know it was in my case. For a little while, I wasn't seeing all the progress that was made. I was just seeing what was left to do, and I was just pouring that, To be honest, that's what was going on inside my noggin. And then I was also thinking about the church, and I was thinking about you know, Sunday, maybe like a Wednesday night Bible study, and I was thinking all this stuff, and I was saying there's just not enough time to get this done. And I wasn't thinking about, look at where we've come in the last year and a half. The last year and a half, where all we have come to. All the new members of the church family, I wasn't thinking about that. And I think... We all need to refocus. I was, I, I had to, for me personally, I think Elijah, I think that's what he's having to do. Doesn't mean we're bad people, it just means we're human. Now, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. Elijah collapsed up under that tree. He was at the point of physical exhaustion because he was running as fast as his feet could carry him. As he was sleeping, the angel of the Lord touched him and told him to get up and eat. And he looked around, and there was uh, some hot stones. They call it a hard cake. It was bread that was baked at the time on hot stones. And there was a jar of water there. And so he ate and drank a little bit and laid down again. And then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Now, those of you that might be reading your Bible, some translations have this as Mount Horeb. They're the same thing. Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai are the same place. It's just different translations say it different ways. I think this brings us to another lesson we learned from Elijah, taking care of ourselves. How many of us, when we get depressed, we either don't eat or we eat everything in sight? Now, me, I eat everything in sight. Chili cheese Fritos, barbecue chips, chocolate. You could put it on a flip-flop, I would eat it. <laughs> and we now you're going to talk about what I would order at the Waffle House. It would be hash browns with so much stuff on it, it should come with an plastic. But that's me. Now, I know some people won't eat a thing. Another thing that hits me, I don't sleep well. I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I am thinking about all these things that I need to do, I should have done, I wish I had done, or I wish I had done. Anybody kind of like that? That is one extreme or another, and the end result, you wear yourself down worrying about this. But look at what God did with Elijah first. He met his physical needs. And that's not always how God does things, but the physical needs are important. In this case, he had to focus in. He had to get him ready because there was more to do. Sometimes, one of the most spiritual things a person can do is to get some rest, and get something to eat and just kind of replenish yourself or her herself and just think. Just to refocus. And it's hard to refocus if you 
have not slept well, if you have not eaten or not eaten enough of the right things. I think God still uses his servants, like in verse 5, woke Elijah up. How many times do you, how many of us have that friend that's just basically the snap out of it friend? Snap out of it. You got to take care of yourself. You're running around like a chicken with your head cut off. Stop. Take a moment. Eat something. Get some rest. Think about this tomorrow. One thing to do after procedures in the hospital, they tell you don't, don't make any important decisions. Because you looped out on drugs for a few hours and you hadn't had anything to eat the night before. There's a reason why they tell you not to do that. Think about it like going to the grocery store. How many of us went to the grocery store hungry? <laughs> what has that led to? A very high grocery bill. Reese's Cups, Hershey Bars, uh, you know, the uh, Jack Wings Jerky, all of these important essentials <laughs> that we get. And I think emotional decisions are the same way. If you're tired and you're exhausted and you're worn down, are you going to make the best decisions? Or how likely are you to be focused on what's got you down to begin with? <laughs> and God puts those people in our lives that just bring it back around and tell us they give a, they give a voice of clarity that we need. And how can you tell if that voice of clarity, that friend that you have, that family member, how can you tell they, their heart's in the right place? Is if what they're telling you, you can look back and you can see in this, that is what God would have told you, Jesus would have told you, prophet would have told you, they're trying to put you in the right direction. God knows that we're more likely to be tempted and make bad decisions when we're weaker. Think about it. When did Satan tempt Jesus after 40 days of fasting. And Elijah needed some special instruction from God, but first he needed physical strength through nourishment. He was in no condition to listen or to do what he was about to have to do. Twice he's told to eat and drink, and twice he's told to sleep. I think again we're reminded we're human beings. And we're designed to function as humans. Human being, you gotta sleep, you gotta eat. You gotta, if you can, get some calmness in your mind. God knew that Elijah was about to take a very long, difficult journey, and he needed to be prepared physically and spiritually. And God also did something that I had not thought about. Moses fasted for 40 days and 40 nights on Mount Sinai. Jesus was going to fast 40 days and 40 nights in the same wilderness. These great men are undertaking similar journeys. Verses 9 through 13, he arrives to Mount Sinai and he went to a cave and some biblical scholars say, and in Exodus, Moses wanted to see the essence of God. God led him to a cave. Most biblical scholars agree this is where Elijah was led to, the exact same cave. Got there, he spent the night. The Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Many times when we get depressed and discouraged, are we really in that spot where we need to be at in life? Are we really doing what we need to be doing? Sometimes we are, but sometimes I think Elijah might have maybe went in a different direction than what God was looking at for him. Now in verse 10, Elijah said, Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me, uh, kill me too. 
God told him in verse 11, go out and stand before me on the mountain. And Elijah went out there and God in this just windstorm came down the mountain. It was such a terrible blast even the rock started moving. God wasn't in that wind though. There was an earthquake after that. But he wasn't in it. And after the earthquake there was a fire. Lit up the desert night. God wasn't there. Now here's Elijah. Seeing all this, and just the breeze of the desert going by, and he's smelling the remains of that fire. Then he heard a sound, a gentle whisper in the wilderness in the midst of all this calamity. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave, and a voice said, What are you doing here, Elijah? That third lesson from Elijah is no matter how far we try to travel from God, he's there just the way we need him. Elijah was running for his life, but I think in some level he was running from God. Felt like he failed him. The Bible didn't say it, but I think he did. I think he thought this was the blow that he was going to have to do and Israel would be on the right path. Many times we think we're one and done. The work never stops. The battles always go on and the journey continues. Elijah was tired. He felt like he failed. God responded in a way that only he could. He wasn't a God of vengeance at that time. His voice didn't come through the loud wind or the earthquake or the fire. Bowed with gentle breeze. A lot of times we think of God talking to us by doing big things like miracles, parting the sea, and that is an illustration of his power. But sometimes God talks to us in the little things. Just when we need that to just keep us going. It's God. We have to learn to listen for him in the big things and the little things because he can talk loud or he can talk soft. Sometimes he talks so soft we can only hear it in our hearts. We have to listen for God to talk to us in the way he wants to. For a moment, I want you to put yourself in Elijah's shoes. You just won this victory that will be written about for 2,500 years. You wipe out. God through you wiped out. The single biggest evil in your homeland. And you're on the run. You're living day to day. Elijah was so distraught, he didn't want to live anymore, and his desire to be a prophet advanced as well. You can be worn down, and it can be so tempting to just throw your hands up. And just walk away. And just to say, and I'm not talking about me personally, but I think having most of us come to a point that I'm tired. I don't want to do this anymore. Go ahead. How many times with a toddler or a small child have we like, okay, let's let's see what happens when you do pull the dog's tail one time too many. But you love the dog so much that you don't want to do this. <laughs> but with children and then as adults, sometimes we can try and try and try and try. And we just get more down. This moment, Elijah didn't need the power and the strength of a wind, an earthquake, or a fire. I think he would have been overwhelmed. This man was on the point of breaking. He was on the point of suicide. He just wanted God to take him. He was done. He thought he'd follow this good fight. What he needed that moment was the common reassurance of God's presence. God knew this and he met him in that manner. Verses 14 through 18. He replied again, I have zealously served the God of the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you and torn down your altars. 
and killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Then the Lord told him, Go back the way you came. Travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, I'll appoint Hezekiah to be king of Aram. Then appoint Jehu, son, grandson of, of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And appoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel, Malon, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hezekiah will be killed by Jehu, Jehu, and anyone who escapes Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 elders in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. The final lesson we learn from Elijah's experience is the value of being part of something. Something good. The value of being in a group. A good group, though. In verses 10 and 15, Elijah told God he was the only one left and the rest of the prophets had been killed. I can feel discouragement when I read those words. And I've said it before up here, being alone, that's a terrible feeling. And God gave Elijah more work to do. He didn't tell him, it, it's going to be all right. It's, no, you get up, you go back the way you came, you're going to go here, you're going to do this. Because he knew he had more work. I think inside Elijah knew he had more work to do. God gave something else to this discouraged and depressed prophet. That are beyond work to do. He gave him a friend. He gave him a successor. Elijah needed a friend. The core of his complaint before God was that he was alone. He mentioned in verses 10 and 15, I'm the only one. And he gave him someone like minded. That means a lot to you because you can get in the crowd. Or are you going to get in the good crowd? You're going to get in the crowd you need to be in. You can find friends there and there when everything's going good. But what about the ones when they, who's going to be there for you when the good times are over and you really need someone? Those are the folks God puts in your life. God let him know that there was a man ready to learn from him and to be his disciple and his companion. Elijah also needed hope. And he found that. I have a successor. My legacy, my ministry is not in vain. In this country, this land I love, there are still people here that fear God and worship him. No matter where we are in our faith, fellowship provides us with strength. They say misery loves company, and sometimes it is misery. We go through each other's miseries with each other. That's what it's supposed to be, the good times and the bad. Being around other believers gives us a chance to learn and grow in our faith, and we've all had bad moments, whether it's the loss of a loved one, failed an exam, money problems, crisis of faith, we can find ourselves down. We go too low, it can lead to anger, and we become disillusioned with God. Where were you at? Why aren't you helping me? In those low times, that's why fellowship's even more important. Because we're too busy feeling the wind, and feeling the earth shake up under our feet, and feeling the heat of the fire, to pay attention to the gentle whisper. Sometimes we need those folks to help us to listen for that gentle whisper. Spending time with other believers, it can lift us up a little bit. It helps keep our eyes focused on God. And God also works through them to provide what we need in darker times. Sometimes that person just tells you you're not alone. And you're not wrong. <laughs> listen to what you're feeling. Listen, you're heading the right direction. I know right now it seems like I'll never end. But it will. Coming together with others can also help with healing. Many times God puts people together that have gone through serious, similar experiences. Maybe you're going through a separation or divorce. Maybe you have lost your job. Maybe it's a particular medical condition. Have you ever found yourself connected with someone who's gone through the same thing. 
Maybe it's one of your 7,000. Because our injuries, our spiritual and emotional injuries, they can be marks of shame. Or we think they are. We don't see a separation or divorce as I survived. We see it as a failure. We don't see that loss of a job as something out of our control. We see it as a loss of identity. It's not what we do, it's who we are. And we're human. Most of us human. We, we, we see that. We, we feel that. Coming together is a great way for each of us to grow in our faith. And reading our Bibles and praying are great ways to get closer to God. I think we need more. Our relationship with each other. To be able to share those times. Share those good moments with each other. When we come together in fellowship, we teach each other stuff. There, you'd be surprised how much I learned from my interactions with each one of y'all. More than you'll ever realize. A person that stops listening and stops learning, they, they really are isolated. There might be somebody right now listening to this or in here listening to it that you're worn down, you're running as fast as you can. And you feel like you're about to drop. Stop. Just stop. You might be thinking you're a failure or this situation will never get better. There are seasons in our lives, good and bad, there always will be. I want you to remember these lessons from Elijah. One of the greatest prophets ever written about in the Bible. He got discouraged. He got depressed. He wanted to die. <coughs> we all get discouraged. It doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make you bad in faith. It just means you're human. You take care of yourself physically and spiritually. And I can't really, I'm not going to throw any rocks at anyone. Because Lord knows, I was thinking about Hershey's Bar on the way down here this morning. I, I can do better than that. But don't let yourself get worn down by lack of sleep eating, things like that, because it makes you more prone to making bad decisions. No matter how far you go, God's there. Listen for the whisper. He may not come to you in the storm. He may come to you in the whisper because he knows you can't take more of the storm right now. Sometimes it's hard to listen because I know there have been times in my life that I had messed things up so bad <coughs> that I was ashamed of how far I had messed things up. And to look, <coughs> to hear him, and part of hearing him is that admission, I messed up. I need help. Will you please straighten me out? Also, look for the right people in your life. We're better in a group, but it's okay to be choosy about who you have in your life. What are they meaning for you? When they start asking you to do this or don't do this, is it for you or is it for them? <coughs> There's one way to tell. This will tell you. Because I have seen people, and I'll be the first to tell you, my other half has helped me be a better man than I ever was. But I have also seen people that have gotten connected with folks, and they have been drugged down. Choose the 7,000. Choose the 7,000. They're doing the right thing. Don't go with the 450. That's going to carry you in the wrong direction. Choose the loyal ones. Not the priest of Baal. They change their name, but their heart's still the same. If they're for you, it should be about what they get out of it. If you don't see them when you have a flat tire, if you don't see them when you're broke, are they really there for you? 
All right, y'all, let's stand and go to the Lord in prayer. Do a final song, please. These offers are open. I encourage you to come down. If something's on your mind or if you feel more self-conscious by trying to your chair, just pray. Talk to God. If you are up under that broom bush like Elijah right now and you're discouraged and you're worn down, talk to him. And then get ready for the whisper. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer, Father. Father, let your words be heard from this message, not mine. Let your words and your intent be heard from this message. And Father, there may be people here, maybe people listening, they're worn down, and they're tired, and they're like Elijah, and it doesn't mean they're bad people, Father. It just means this world is worn them down. Father, help them take care of themselves physically, and Father, come to them. Come to them in the way that they will listen. And Father, connect them with people who will build them up. Father, people who will go through the sunshine and rain with them. And Father, then help them to be that person for someone else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.